Today's lesson is evolutionary inaccuracy. Lesson three of series four, creation versus evolution. And next week will be the last lesson of the last series, dangers of evolution. Today's outline will basically be talking about eight inaccuracies. One, secular scientists believe the geological column exists. We'll show it doesn't. They also believe that rocks date the fossils, but then they'll come around and say the fossils date the rocks. They say there's index fossils, and we'll show that there isn't. Anybody here the peppered moth? See some hands. We'll show that that was fraudulent for decades. Um, anybody here ever hear of humans having gill slits? Yep. No, uh, yeah, an embryo stage. Yep, yep, so people have heard that. Vestigial organs, since evolution, they believe that our appendix and our human tailbone was a leftover evolutionary vestigial organ. And we'll say that they're not. They're actually needed. And the last inaccuracy, whales do, they believe whales have a vestigial pelvis that showed that they once walked on the land. But actually those are the bones needed for reproduction. So acknowledgement for today's talk, I'll use a lot of slides from creation science evangelism. If you ever heard of Kent Hovind, also Institute of Creation Research and Answers in Genesis. We'll start with a few biblical verses talking about lies. Proverbs 19.5 states, a false witness will not go unpunished and he who speaks lies will not escape. Psalm 62.4 they only consult to cast him down from his high position. They delight in lies. Proverbs 6.16 6, These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination unto him. 17 A proud look, a lying tongue. Skip to 19 A false witness who speaks lies. John 8.44 Ye are of your father the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. So when we talk about evolutionary inaccuracies, if you look at any textbook, whether it's high school, middle school, college, every one of these have evolution multiple one after another after another after another nothing about creation in any of these textbooks and the one in the the outline i have here in red is the book i referenced that i have up here but it wasn't always that way here's a public school spelling book from 1908 so over 100 years ago and what does it say well it says God created the heavens and the earth. Let's read the uh, box text. God created the heavens and the earth in the six days, and all that was made was very good. 1908, school tech, public school spelling book, textbook. It also says that prayer is a duty. Prayer is a duty, but it is in vain to pray without a sincere desire of heart to obtain what we pray for. To repeat the words of a prayer without such desire is solemn mockery. It also talks about our duty to worship God. God governs the world in infinite wisdom. The Bible teaches us that it is our duty to worship Him. It is a solemn thing to die and appear before God. Now, wouldn't that be wonderful if our textbooks say that today? Well, this is what they say today Evolution is a fact and not theory. Birds arose from non-birds, humans from non-humans. No person who pretends to any understanding of the natural world can deny these facts. Any more than she or he can deny that the earth is round, rotates on its axis, or revolves around the sun. In fact, Bill Nye met with Ken Ham at the Ark Encounter shortly after it was built, and Bill Nye says we're related to bananas. I tell you my biggest, biggest concern, that you're teaching generations of these young people that are just animals, uh, that they come about by natural processes. Aren't you teaching that humans are animals? Are we animals? Yeah. 
We're, we're mammals. Animals. Breathe air. Okay. Isn't that good? So all life is related, right? Of course, right? there's a few of us. Uh, from your seems like lizards. From your perspective, all life is related? Certainly. Even yes, plants? It's we're related to plants? It's one of the fundamental discoveries in all of life okay. science. So we're related to plants? Yes. So we're related to a banana? Yes. Okay. So there you go. <clears throat> because they believe that we evolved from primordial slime when floods of rain fell on the rocks and caused the primordial slime and then we came out of out of the sea and eventually evolved from reptiles to mammals from apes to man so of course he's going to believe that we're related to a banana here's a biology textbook used at the university of science and arts in chickasaw oklahoma and 25 percent of it is devoted to evolution evolution is basically a dying religion but it's surviving on our tax dollars. We'll talk about why. The book up here, over 100 pages, where only the theory of evolution is presented. Creation is not mentioned once. Students are not given any possibility of knowing a reasonable creation model even exists. Here's a short clip I'm going to play from Answers in Genesis. Evolution refuted on Check This Out. This one a lot. Science has proven evolution, therefore evolution is true. Since evolution is true and Christians don't believe it, then Christians don't believe science and they aren't rational people. Really. Let's put that claim to the test. First off, evolution in the sense that things change is evident. No rational person disputes that. Therefore, rational Christians believe it. We can observe change, but evolution in the sense that life came from non-life and then that life began to randomly generate new genetic information and over time it eventually produced humans is something entirely different and something that quite honestly doesn't hold up against science. In other words, evolution in the sense of molecules to man is not scientifically plausible and therefore should not be viewed as scientific fact. Quite honestly, it is in great opposition to science, that is, observational science, the kind of science we can test and repeat and use our five senses to understand. Science demonstrates that over time, Living organisms lose genetic information. They don't gain it. That same science demonstrates that life doesn't arise from non-life. Hey, Follow along from? if you would. Fact one, there is no known observable process by which new genetic information can be added to an organism's genetic code. None. That pretty much refutes evolution right away because there's no way to go from a fish to an amphibian without adding new information, right? If living organisms cannot produce new genetic information, how can anything gradually change into something of higher intelligence or form or complexity? That is, how can anything evolve from an amoeba to a man without adding new genetic information? The answer, of course, is that it can't. Plain and simple. Now, some have speculated and they have imagined all kinds of things and they brought in artists to produce creative renderings based on guesses and they have been successful in telling a very convincing story that humans evolved from ape-like creatures. But those are just drawings, people. They're just stories. But what we really observe is humans are humans and apes are apes. Now, if fact one buried evolutionary thinking deep into the Precambrian soil, this next fact, fact two, tosses so much sediment on it that not even the greatest team of paleontologists with the latest subterranean gizmo could dig up the remains. Check this out. Never, again, never has it been observed that life can come from non-life. So here are two major scientific evidences against evolution. I reiterate for clarity, life has never been observed to come from non-life, and there is no known observable process by which new genetic information can be added to the genetic code of an organism. So molecules to man evolution doesn't really make scientific sense. Yet we are all here, and life is all around us in various forms. Although evolution cannot account for this, the Bible can. The Bible reveals that the all-powerful, all-knowing, supernatural God created the heavens and the earth out of nothing, and all life according to its kinds, that is, each with its own set of genetic information. So, again, what the Bible reveals makes sense of what we see and understand. Evolution does not. Enough said. Hopefully that was pretty clear. Question for the audience. Does anyone think teachers or textbooks should be allowed to use outdated or false information just to get students to believe their theory? What's amazing is when I show you some of the examples, these inaccuracy, evolutionary inaccuracies, some of them go back to 1875. So back to the Bible, Jude 18 and 19. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts these are sensual persons who cause divisions not having the spirit so they're not born again that's how i take it so here's a quote from sir julian huxley one of the world's leading evolutionists was asked in a television interview 
Why did the scientific community jump at Darwin's ideas in the middle 1800s, late 1800s? He said, I suppose the reason why we leapt at the origin of species was that the idea of God interfered with our, what? Sexual mores. Sir Arthur Keith said, evolution is unproved and unprovable. We believe it only because the only alternative is special creation, and that's unthinkable. So let's walk through these inaccuracies. Number one, secular scientists say the geological column gives you the millions of years to prove evolution. But it's inaccurate because it doesn't exist. Let's walk through this. If you look at any high school, even college textbook, they'll talk about the geological column like this. In the early 1800s, each layer of rock was given a name, like Jurassic, an age, and an index fossil. Fossils are really dated by their position in the geologic column since 1830, but that does not exist anywhere in the world except the textbooks. The geological column is the Bible for the evolutionists. Column can only be found one place in the world, and that's in their textbooks. In fact, this textbook even states that. If there were a column of sediments deposited continuously since the formation of the earth, the entire history of the planet will be reconstructed. Unfortunately, no such column exists. The short clip on the geological column from Institute for Creation Research. In every textbook on this, they always produce not only the evolutionary tree of simple going to complex and all, but they also produce a geologic column. The fossils as they're presented go simple to complex, simple one-celled animals down at the bottom and then mammals, man, up at the top. This simple evolutionary picture of simple to complex, it really isn't the story of the fossil record. What you see is complexity at every stage. You do not see this simple to complex change. Uh, that's the story of evolution, but it's not the story of the fossils. The fossils show complexity and design and sudden appearance all along the way. The lowest strata, the Precambrian layer, consists of several geologic eons and contains very few fossils. And then there's a period of time at the beginning of the Paleozoic era where ancient life seems to have simply exploded. The fossil record suddenly goes from showing fossils of relative simplicity to an overabundance of fossils showing great diversity and increasing complexity. This is commonly referred to as the Cambrian explosion. The Cambrian layer gives evidence of a sudden proliferation of life forms that were not present in the previous layer. So from the Precambrian to the Cambrian layers, you go from very few fossils to a great abundance of fossils, yet no transitional fossils in between. Where are the simpler transitional forms that should be mixed in this rock-hard record? If they exist, they should be found in rock layers that are lower, therefore older. They're just not there. And if you look carefully at the geologic strata in the Grand Canyon, for instance, there are, according to an evolutionary worldview, huge gaps in time between some of the layers. Meaning whole layers of geologic time have gone missing. Either the layers were never deposited or were eroded away. These gaps are called unconformities, and even secular scientists have a hard time explaining where these missing layers went. They admit that the fossil record is incomplete in the Grand Canyon. Notice the unconformity. One part of the Grand Canyon is missing over 1.2 to 1.6 billion years. I have a picture of the Grand Canyon. We were there this past summer, and notice the layers are stacked like pancakes. I want to point out a few things here. I try to draw a line where you can see a layer. If the layers are different ages, then why don't we see erosion marks between the layers if they, each layer took a million years to deposit? And if the layers are different ages, then why are there no layers of soil seeping down, oozing bet between the layers? It's because it happened during the worldwide flood in one year, and each layer was a tsunami wave of deposits. So if the geologic column existed like they have it in the textbook, in one location it would be 100 miles thick, but you see it nowhere. So inaccuracy one, the geologic column does not exist as it's displayed in the textbook. Inaccuracy number two, circular reasoning. They'll say the rocks date the fossils, but the fossils date the rocks better. Here's a textbook, Earth Science. 
um, index fossils, or it says scientists use index fossils to determine the age of the rock layers. So index fossils date the rock layers. That's on page 331. On page 358, it says the age of the layers determine the age of the fossils found in it. So it's reverse logic or circular reasoning. Here's another book. Page 306, it says the layers of rock can be dated by the types of fossils they contain. So you can date the rock by the fossils that's in them. The very next page, scientists have determined the relative times of appearance and disappearance of many kinds of organisms from the location of their fossils in the sedimentary rock layers. So you can date the fossil by the rock. You see, that's kind of circular reasoning. They just reverse the order, and that's what it is. Strata is another word for layers. So the strata are dated by the fossils, then the fossils are dated by the strata. That's circular reasoning and, and logic. That's a no-no. Examine what evolutionists say to themselves about circular reasoning. J.E. O'Rourke in American Journal of Science said, the intelligent layman has long suspected circular reasoning and the use of rocks to date the fossils and fossils to date the rocks. The geologist has never bothered to think of a good reply, feeling the explanations are not worth the trouble as long as everything works out and their, their results don't bother me, you know, I'm a scientist. Are the authorities maintaining, on the other hand, that, the evolu that evolution is documented by geology and, on the other hand, that geology is documented by evolution? Isn't that a circular argument? And the Encyclopedia Brit Britannica on geology, it says, it cannot be denied that from a strictly philosophical standpoint, geologists are here arguing in a circle. The succession of organisms have been determined by a study of their remains embedded in the rocks, and the relative ages of the rocks are determined by the remains of the organisms that they contain. The rocks do date the fossils, but the fossils date the rocks more accurately. See how that makes no sense? The charge of circular reasoning and stratigraphy can be handled in several ways. It can be ignored because it's not the proper concern of the public. They shouldn't know these details. It can be denied by calling down the law of evolution. How dare you? Evolution's a fact. Didn't you know that? It can be admitted as a common practice or it can be avoided by pragmatic reasoning. So inaccuracy number two, circular reasoning date the rocks by the fossils and date the fossils by the rocks. Andrew Snelling, I have a clip where he talks about the order of fossils in the rock and they, do they favor long ages. Doesn't the order of fossils in the rock record favor long ages? Does the order of fossils in the rock record favor long ages? Absolutely not. Let's look at the order in the fossil record. When we go to the lowest layers, we find only marine fossils, shallow water marine invertebrate fossils. And it's only higher in the record that we find the remains of amphibians, then reptiles, and birds and mammals. Now, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that the flood began in the ocean basins. The fountains of the great deep broke open. And that means the ocean floor was ripped apart. You would have generated tsunamis or tidal waves that would have moved towards the ocean towards the continents that means they would have ripped up the sediments on the ocean floor picked up the shallow marine uh, critters and dumped them up on the continents and that's exactly what we find in the record the shallow water marine creatures are buried first then as the ocean waters rise higher and higher they're going to bury the suffocated fish and then they're going to overwhelm amphibians and then the reptiles, the mammals and the birds. It's interesting that we find in the fossil record the footprints of the uh, mammals and the birds, the reptiles and the amphibians before we actually find the whole critter buried and fossilised. And that fits exactly with what the Bible says about the flood because these critters who are quite mobile, unlike the the corals that have to stay in one place so they're easily overwhelmed. The fish, well, they sense a certain amount of danger and then they suffocate and get buried. But the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds and the mammals, they can sense danger, they're more mobile, they can move around. And that's what they did. They were running around on, on wet surfaces, leaving their footprints, swimming in the waters, leaving more footprints until they finally got overwhelmed by the flood waters and were buried.
Look at, look at the picture another way. If we take habitats on the present earth, we've got different habitats at different elevations. So at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, for example, we've got a desert environment with cacti. At the top of the Grand Canyon, the south rim, we've got Ponderoso Pine. Now imagine the flood waters progressively rising, they would progressively bury these different habitats. And so you don't get mixtures, you get these different habitats. And that's exactly what we see. Marine habitats buried first and later land habitats. So the land creatures would have been buried last. And that fits exactly what the Bible says. Does it need long ages? Absolutely not. With the catastrophic global flood as described in the Bible, you have these sediments being ripped up, the creatures being buried and fossilized in an order that fits exactly what the Bible says about the progression of the flood. So no, the order of the fossils do not favor long ages, but they do fit with the biblical record of the Genesis flood. Hopefully that put it all together. Inaccuracy number three, sector scientists say that there are index fossils, but there aren't. Let's, what are index fossils? Well, trilobites existed more than 400 million years ago, and that's a sea creature, as Dr. Snelling mentioned. And, but that was buried first with the flood. But the uh, evolutionists said, no, that's the oldest thing. It was over 400 million years ago. So this index fossil is in the lowest strata. So it has to be the oldest. The next index fossil is the lobe fin fish, and I have it circled there on the screen. And that was over 300 million years ago. And then the third index fossil were the dinosaurs living over 70 million years ago. So trilobite fossils make good index fossils. If a trilobite such as this one is found in a rock layer, the rock layer is probably formed 500 to as much as 600 million years ago, as it says in the Holt Modern Earth Science on page 290. So if the trilobites were buried 500 to 600 million years ago, there couldn't have been a person, right? According to evolution. Well, we find that a human shoe print stepped on a trilobite. And there's a trilobite shoe print in the fossil record. Now, if we believe evolution, it couldn't have been a human that stepped on the trilobite, right? Maybe it was an alien who visited the planet back 500, 600 million years ago and stepped on the trilobite to cause that footprint, right? This alien has a cowboy boots. Pretty snazzy, huh? Okay, trilobite eyes have the most sophisticated eye lenses ever produced by nature. But according to evolution, they're supposed to be, you know, the simplest form because we evolved from the trilobites. So they should be not difficult at all, but they are. In fact, the eyes of the early trilobites have never been exceeded for complexity or acuity. In fact, if you zoom into the trilobite eye, it's pretty amazing. And in fact, it's more sophisticated than our eyes. Now, if trilobites are supposed to be 500 million years old and they're the earliest forms of evolution, why do they have such a complex eye? Also, there are many varieties of trilobites. Remember, we said God created the kinds. Well, there's a trilobite kind, and there's different pictures of different trilobites. But there's living trilobites today, and there's pictures of people handling them. In fact, these deep-sea isopod crustaceans are found in the coastal waters of Florida and Mexico. And you can even go to Mount Blanco Museum, east of Lubbock, and they have a display of these trilobites. And you can read also in this book called The Evolutionary Cruncher. So if the trilobites are a fossil index and they live today, let's go to the next one. And yeah, they're still alive. Let's go to the next index, fossil index creature. In this textbook, it says the first amphibians. Amphibians probably descended from a lobe-finned fish, such as the one shown here in figure A, where the fish started getting legs, and they started, the fish started crawling on the shore. In B, although early amphibians were probably semi-aquatic, the muscles and bones in their legs allowed movement on land. So where do we see this? We see this lobe-finned fish is considered an index fossil, 
in the fossil record. It's 360 to 410 million years old, right? Well, a low fin fish, one of them is called a, the coelacanth, were thought to be extinct for millions of years until one was caught off the coast of Africa in 1938. And they can reach up to almost 10 feet in length. Here's a picture of a recent scuba diver swimming right next to this 370 million year old lobe fin coelacanth and it's still alive. Here's another picture of some Asians catching a coelacanth lobe fin fish. Despite the textbook saying we have evolved from this fish where they came up shore and crawled. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, that's a biology book. It's also in my book up here. And here's a book from Samantha Weinberg. She said, A Fish Caught in Time. A Fish Caught in Time is an uh, entrancing story of the most rare and precious fish in the world. Our own great uncle, 40 million times removed. <laughs> they won't give up the millions of years. Well, we found him. Yeah, he was out there swimming. And you'll be taught that dinosaurs lived in the Cretaceous era over 70 million years ago. But, we, remember I gave the talk on dinosaurs in the Bible. What were they in the Bible? Anybody remember the dragons, right? They were dragons, and they lived with man. But you can't say that to an evolutionist. That's, but things are changing. In fact, in USA Today, March 29, 2005, Dinosaur has paleontologists thrilled to the bone. They really weren't thrilled. Blood vessels found in a T-Rex fossil. And Mary Schweitzer was the first person who found red blood cells in an unfossilized section of a T-Rex bone. Also soft tissue. We have quotes from a Montana State paleontologist. It may be that this isn't a unique specimen. The find could force scientists to reconsider how all the fossils are formed. Well, why not reconsider when they were formed? Because they don't want to give up their millions of years. Maybe it was preserved for millions of years in a way that we can't, you know, understand. Anyway, I have a clip that goes about four and a half minutes on dinosaur soft tissue. I think you'll find this interesting. The general public is under the impression uh, that dinosaurs lived 65, 68 million years ago. That's what you find in the textbooks. That's what you find in the popular magazines. However, science has really outstripped that knowledge in the last 10 years or so. Why? Because we found soft tissue in many different specimens from different fossil sites all over the world. Uh, back in the mid-90s, uh, Mary Schweitzer from North Carolina State University began working with specimens at the Hell Creek Formation in Montana. And so what they found was a large T-Rex. And they excavated out the T-Rex, and they excavated out the femur, which is the long leg bone. And she soaked it in a weak acid called EDTA. And what that acid does is it dissolves away the bone mineral and it leaves whatever's inside that bone uh, undissolved. And in this case, uh, she found soft tissues. And the, the tech who did the, the dissolution for her pointed out, I'm finding soft tissue. I'm finding uh, something that's not characteristic of very old bones. And in this case, they think they're 68 million years old. So she had the tech repeat the experiment over and over and over again, and, and each time it produced this soft tissue. And what she found was actual blood vessels inside this femur that was fully mineralized and encapsulated, which would have protected those soft tissues over deep time. And she found what looked like red blood cells. So using this immunohistochemistry, very sophisticated experiments, she proved the existence of these original biomolecules and biomaterials that go back to the original dinosaur. About five years ago, the Creation Research Society decided to mount a new project called iDino, the investigation of dinosaur intact natural osteotissue or bone tissue. And so we designed this project to go out and find dinosaur bones in the digs, in known fossil digs, to bring them back to the lab to 
decalcify them to put them in that weak acid, dissolve away the mineral, and see if we could find soft tissue inside the bones. On our last day, with only a few hours left, we found the largest triceratops horn that was ever found on this ranch in the Hell Creek Formation. About 45 inches long, about nine inches in diameter, and it was buried three feet below the surface. We did the decalcification experiment, and what we found is really different from what Mary Schweitzer found. She found individual cells floating in the solution after she decalcified the bone in this weak acid. We found entire sheets of soft tissue. But we thin sectioned this and we found entire stacks of osteocytes inside this thick sheet of fibrillar bone material. So the question is, how do these very delicate uh, very uh, specialized molecules and proteins survive 68 million years. Thinking about the layers and the index fossils, what would you expect from a global flood? Well, billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And that's what we see. So inaccuracy number three, there are no index fossils. In fact, there's two are still alive today. And the one we know still existed until they were wiped out, all the dragons. We're finding out that last week we talked about carbon-14 and all the dinosaur bones. They have to be less than 95,000 years old, and they're only 4,300 years old. And now they're, they're finding soft tissue. So it's changing, slowly changing the scientists to come, come on board and say, yeah, these dinosaurs aren't that old. So the fossil record is the graveyard of the global flood. So there are no index fossils because we see the same, a lot of the animals are in, in the fossil record are still alive today except for dinosaurs. Number four, I, I mentioned about the peppered moth story. I know a couple people raised their hand, they heard of it, so let's go over it. It was fraudulent, it's another inaccuracy. It's in the textbook I have up here. They haven't taken it out. Peppered moth, let's talk about it. It was taught as an example of evolution and natural selection in practice. The common moth is speckled, but there was a black variety in the UK, and it was rare in 1850. British ecologist ABD Kettlewell performed an experiment in the early 1950s. He raised dark and light peppered moss in a lab and released it into the wooded areas in England. He reported more dark moss recovered in the city due to pollution and darkening of trees because in the 50s you had some of the trees that were near these plants turn black from the soot, okay? And it caused the birds to eat the light-colored moss and not the dark moss. If you can see on the picture in the upper left, th there's two moths on a tree. One's black and you can barely see it and there's a light-colored one. So the thinking is, the light one, uh, the birds can go and grab it and eat it, and it, it can't see the dark one. And here's another picture, the third one over with a dark tree and a light-colored moth, and it sticks out so the birds could easily see it. Kettlewell called this Darwin's Missing Evidence, and it quickly became standard fare in biology textbooks. The problem, peppered moths do not rest on tree trunks. Photos in the textbooks became fraudulent because... They were taking dead moss and gluing them or pinning them on the tree trunks. And then they took the pictures. Some sh uh, show live specimen placed on the hand of the tree trunk because in the daytime the moss are drowsy and they tend to stay put. So if they weren't gluing them or pinning them on the tree, they would put a couple on the tree and they were a little drowsy so they would stay there and take another picture. His fraudulent experiment was exposed about 30 years later. In fact, University of Chicago, Dr. Jerry Coyne said that finding out about the moss story being fraudulent was like when he found out when he was six years old that his father was actually bringing Christmas presents and there was no more Santa Claus. So this is known, a known fraudulent experiment, but it's still in all the textbooks. In fact, only two moths were actually seen resting on the tree in his multi-decade research. So the peppered moth is known to be fraudulent, but it's in all the textbooks trying to show it actually happened to show the evidence of evolution. In the experiment, they said there were 95% light moths and 5% dark. And then by the, after the experiment, it 
switch to 5% light and 95% dark. In reality, only two moths were on the tree without them pasting or gluing dead moths to show the fraudulent experiment. The book I have up here, there's a picture of it. It's still in the textbook. Here's a pepper moth story described in Holt Biology where it goes into the details of the experiment and notice it does not say that it was fraudulent. Another book used at Northern Michigan University describing the peppered moths and how it's evidence for evolution. In fact, Jerry Coyne said, from time to time evolutionists re-examine a classical experimental study and find to their horror that it is flawed or downright wrong. This prize horse in our stable of examples of natural selection is in bad shape. And while not yet ready for the glue factory, needs serious attention. In fact, it's still in the Tulsa Zoo. Here's it where it's showing the peppered moths. And they did not disclose the fraudulent experiment. So inaccuracy number four, the peppered moth story was fraudulent for nearly 40 years since the 1980s. And it's still in all the textbooks. Number five, textbooks say humans have gill slits, but they don't. In this biology textbook, it highlights the evidence of evolution, one of the evidences from development. The similarity between early stages and the development of many different animals helped convince Darwin that all forms of life shared common ancestors. So this textbook states the similarity between early stages and the development of many different animals helped convince Darwin that all forms of life shared common ancestors. And then Darwin considered this by far the strongest single class of facts in favor of his theory. Haeckel called it the biogenetic law. He also called it, maybe you've heard of this term, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Anyone hear that fancy term at all? Yeah, I see some hands up. Here's a textbook that says the presence of these fish-like structures in embryos are different species shows that these animals have evolved from a fish and they share the basic pattern of fish development. You have a fish, looks like this, with gill slits. You have a bird, an embryo, looks like a fish, and a human looks like a fish with a tail. It is as if the embryo retains a memory of its origins and starts to copy them during its development. These structures persist in adult fish. Even Sigmund Freud said the evolutionary idea that Freud, I'm sorry, the evolutionary idea that Freud relied on most heavily in the manuscript is the maxim that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. That is, that the development of the individual recapitulates the evolution of the entire species. So here's another textbook that states we have tails and gill pouches during our development as embryos, similar to adult fish. We have gills like a fish. Well, they have nothing to do with breathing. In fact, they're actually part of our throat and neck tissue, and it's not part of breathing. Ernest Haeckel said the turning point in his thinking was when he read Charles Darwin's Origin of Species in 1860. By 1868, many evolutionists were getting worried about the lack of evidence for Darwin's theory. Ernest Haeckel to the rescue. He was one of the worried evolutionists to decide to manufacture some evidence. The fraud began in 1868 while Haeckel was drawing a family tree for mankind. He became worried about the large gap between non-living and living organisms. To complete the chart, he decided to create a series of organisms he called Monera. In 1869, Huxley claimed to have discovered these organisms or in ocean mud samples. But by 1875, the chemist John Buchanan revealed that Huxley's discovery was simply calcium sulfate from seawater. But Haeckel refused to admit his fraud and reprinted the Monera drawings in his book, History of Creation. He reached an all-time low when he began presenting his biogenetic law, also known as the law of recapitulation. And he taught that early animal retraces the stages of evolution as embryonic development. This is a drawing back then of a dog embryo at four weeks on the left and a human embryo at four weeks on the right and they look quite different. But Haeckel's doctor drawings of a dog and a human embryo appeared in his book, History of Creation. What did he do? He increased the size of the dog embryo head. He decreased the size of the human embryo head, changed the eyes, and the, he extended the posterior length, doubled in size to make it look like a tail. 
So there's the comparison. The top is the actual and the bottom is the fake. Haeckel's famous, infamous set of 24 drawings purporting to show eight different embryos in three stages of development as published, as published by him and Anthropogeny in Germany in 1875. So Haeckel made large posters of this, of his fake drawings. He went over all of Germany and told everyone, you have to believe in the theory of evolution. Here's the evidence, because we have the proof right here. After all, he was the professor of embryology, and he wouldn't lie, would he? And how many people in 1875 can fact-check his pictures because you would need probably a microscope to look at these embryos and cut open animals? Haeckel nearly single-handedly converted Germans to believing in evolution through his poster and going out and presenting it. This led to the idea, well, if evolution is true, then maybe one race can evolve faster than the others. I wonder who it is. Must be the Germans. We'll cover this topic next week, how evolution influenced the Germans and other groups. This is the actual photo on the bottom versus the top, and you can see the embryos were all different. Well, they found him out. He made, he, this is records from the University of Jena trial in 1875. Tried and convicted, and he confessed, a small percent of my embryonic drawings are forgeries, those namely for which the observed material is so incomplete or insufficient as to fill in and reconstruct the missing links by hypothesis and comparative synthesis. I should feel utterly condemned were it not that hundreds of the best observers and bio biologists lie under the same charge. So what he's saying, he admits he did it and others would do the same thing. So he wasn't repentant. So let's look at the timeline. Darwin's book of the origin of species published in 1859. He predicted evidence would be found to support his theory. Ten years later, Haeckel faked the drawings of embryos to use as evidence for evolution. And then by 1875, he was convicted of fraud by six professors in his own university. The Gill Slits idea was proven wrong. 1875. Despite its status as fake, Darwin continued to use the biogenetic law as the most important evidence of the, his book, Common Descent. In fact, that's what he has on page 9. The human embryo itself at the very early period can hardly be distinguished from that of other members of the vertebrate kingdom. All these frauds were brought to public attention in 1911 book, Haeckel's Frauds and Forgeries. The autonomous uh, F. Keeble of Freiburg University said, it clearly appears that Haeckel has in many cases freely invented embryos or reproduced the illustrations given by others in a subsequently charged form. And they also called it a sin against scientific truthfulness. The biogenetic law as a proof for evolution is valueless. Surely the biogenetic law is dead as a doornail. Walter J. Book, Evolution by an Orderly Law, said, moreover, the biogenetic law has become so deeply rooted in biology thought that it cannot be weeded out in spite of its having been demonstrated to be wrong by numerous subsequent scholars. That's why we still see it in the textbooks. They can't weed it out because it's such a good lie. Here's ha Haeckel's fake drawings used in 1999. Here's Haeckel's fake drawings still used in 2005, University of North Dakota. And it's in all those six textbooks that Kent Hovind surveyed. It's in this Holt Biology book. It's in this biology book. It's in this textbook entitled Evolution and the Myth of Creationism. The author, Tim Barra, is still teaching it 115 years after it's proven wrong. The title should have been Creation and the Myth of Evolution because they're showing inaccuracies. So it's in this textbook when the teaching was 123 years after it was wrong. It's in this book. It's in this book. It's in this book. It's in the book I have up here, and I have it tabbed if you want to see it. And that's the picture in my book. The highlight is how we evolved, but it was a fraud in 1875, still being published as a fact of evolution. Here's a college textbook, Gill Pouches. <laughs> and it's to top it off, when you take an SAT test to enter college, you have to study on gill slits to pass the test. Gill slits are in the SAT test. If the question pops up, you have to respond that this fraudulent icon of evolution since 1875 is a fact to get the question correct. It's in this biology book. It's in this biology cliff notes for 
Here's another textbook at Kent State University. Even though gill slits and embryos are proven false, in 1875, they have published the inaccuracies in the textbooks because evolution has no real scientific evidence to go by. So number five, gill slits were proven false since 1875, and it's still in all the textbooks. Inaccuracy number six, the appendix, they believe was vestigial, but it's not. If you look at this science dictionary, relating to a body, vestigial is relating to a body part that has become small and lost its use because of evolutionary change. Secular evolutionary scientists believe the appendix is useless and serve no or little purpose. It can be cut out of our body since it was an evolutionary relic and holdover from our past. In fact, in this text, it says one of the classic lines of evidence for evolution, debated even before Darwin was born, is vestigial organs. These structures are the remnants of organs that apparently were better developed and more functional in the ancestors of the species. They now serve little or no purpose, or in some cases have been converted to new functions. Another book talks about it, but there are no vestigial organs. Even if there were some, that would be the opposite of evolution because vestigial organs, you're losing information. Evolution says you're gaining information to go to the next creature. Here's a text used at Northern Michigan University. Uh, talks about it. It is difficult to assign any current function to the vermiform appendix. In many respects, it's a dangerous organ. Quite often, it becomes infected leading to an inflammation called appendicitis. Without surgical removal, the appendix may burst, allowing the contents of the gut to come in contact with the lining of the body cavity, a potential fatal event. In 1925, evolutionary zoologist Horatio Hackett Newman stated, there are, according to Weitersheim, no less than 180 vestigial structures in the human body, the sufficient to make of a man a veritable walking museum of antiques. Scientific America, November 2001, long regarded as a vestigial organ with no function in the human body, the appendix is now thought to be one of the sites where immune responses are initiated. In this book it says, the appendix is required to activate killer B cells in your immune system, like your thymus ac activates T cells. Its removal, the appendix, also increases a person's susceptibility to leukemia, Hodgkin disease, cancer of the colon, and cancer of the ovaries. So inaccuracy number six, the appendix is not vestigial and it's needed for a healthy immune system. I got two more. Inaccuracy number seven, the human tailbone they thought was vestigial and it's not. In this book it says the coccyx is a small bone at the end of the human vertebral column. It has no present function. And it's thought to be the remainder of bones that once occupied the long tail of a living, tree-living ancestor. So they believe that our tailbone was a leftover from us when we were monkeys with tails. This is all that's left of the tail, the most mammals still use in this book. And they're still teaching this lie. It's in Discover 2004 magazine. And they even bring this up in biology today and tomorrow at a Hartford Community College in Bel Air, Maryland. You're supposed to be using critical thinking. At the end of your backbone is a coccyx, a few small bones that are fused together. Could the human coccyx be a vestigial structure or is the start of a new, newly evolving structure? They lead you to two inaccurate answers. There are muscles that attach to the tailbone. I'll show you a video from a doctor who explains it. We need the tailbone. In fact, there's nine muscles attached to it. If someone were to cut out your tailbone, then some of your innards would fall through when you jumped up and down. Vestigial organs, evidence for evolution from Dr. David Menton. Vestigial organs, evidence for evolution? Let's look at vestigial organs and, and what they are. Probably Charles Darwin himself was among the first to use this idea of useless organs in our body uh, as evidence of evolution. Robert Wiedersheim, back in 1896, uh, came up with 86 vestigial organs in the body. And uh, Wiedersheim's 
vestigial organs included the parathyroid uh, and included the pineal, even included the pituitary gland, without which, of course, we'd be in very serious difficulty. But at his time, uh, functions were not known for these organs. And this is one of the problems with vestigial organs. Uh, what's the difference between an organ that truly has a function, uh, but we don't know the function from an organ that, let's say, has no function? So it uh, depends on our ego, whether we're willing to say we just simply don't know the function or it couldn't have a function if I didn't know it. Uh, let's look at a few specific examples, critically, uh, of vestigial organs. Well, I think the most famous vestigial organ of all in our body is the appendix. That and the tailbone. We'll talk about both of them. What about the appendix? First of all, there really is no evolutionary story to the appendix. Uh, evolutionists say that uh, it's a vestigial cecum. What's a cecum? This part of the large intestine that hangs down below where the small intestine enters is called the cecum. So the first thing we need to know is humans already have a cecum. So the appendix can't be a vestige of a cecum we used to have. Where is the appendix? Well, the appendix is right down here. If we can turn this perhaps a bit, maybe I can even pull this out. <laughs> We've opened up the cecum, and this opening right here goes into the appendix. Now, is the appendix useless? <laughs> For many years, we thought, uh, people thought it didn't have a function. And so back in the 1900s, people would uh, cut out the appendix even when it was normal. Surgeons would often just grab the appendix when they were in the vicinity. Uh, but that's not done today. And uh, one thing that's come up just within the last few years is we now have a pretty good, very plausible function. The appendix appears to be a safe house in which bacteria can be harbored that are useful. And you might think bacteria are all harmful or not. We have certain bacteria that are useful for digestion. And uh, what can happen is in a bout of diarrhea or something, the large intestine can be purged of its useful bacteria. And you need to get the good bacteria, the useful ones, back in the gut again. And it's believed that this little appendix structure sticking off to the side as it does out of the main tract is used to then re-inoculate uh, the intestine with the useful bacteria. What about the other often cited example uh, of a vestigial organ. Uh, that would have to be the so-called tailbone, right down in here. It is not functionally a tail, and of course there is no empirical evidence that it ever did serve as a tail in human beings. And so uh, what then is this? Is it just useless? Is it just simply the end? Hardly. It's a very useful piece of bone. In fact, uh, if you rank ordered bone and how important bones were, on how many muscles attached to it, coming from how many different directions. I think this little piece of bony real estate might win. Uh, it is the focal point for the attachment of all of the muscles that form the floor of what we call the pelvic diaphragm. The pelvic diaphragm is a muscular bowl that attaches to the brim of the pelvis here and then converges and attaches to the coccyx. That's a better name for the tailbone, the coccyx, which really means a cuckoo's beak. It looks sort of like a cuckoo's beak. And uh, that muscular floor, right where my hand is there now, that muscular floor holds the organs that reside in this lower part uh, of the abdomen and pelvis. And what organs are they? Well, let's take a look here. We'll pull out the liver, and pull out the stomach, pull out a few organs. Uh, we'll pull out the whole small or large intestine. And now we're down to that muscular floor. And sitting on top of this is the bladder, the structure here. In the case of a male, under the bladder, we have the uh, prostate gland. It's uh, way down in here. Uh, now you can see that bowl very nicely down there. In a female, the uterus would be here. Uh, and the end of the colon, the sigmoid colon, comes down into this region. Now, if we didn't have that muscular floor, because we stand vertically, uh, the first time we would go <coughs> like that, uh, whoopee, things could sort of just <laughs> go right down through uh, uh, this area, but that muscular floor holds everything in place. So, an exceedingly 
important bony structure. Not a useless, a leftover vestigial tail. Well, that's uh, my story on vestigial organs, and uh, I hope you've learned something new here. The last inaccuracy, the whale does not have a vestigial pelvis. The second half of that dictionary statement said, whales, for example, have small bones located in the muscle of their body walls that are vestigial bones of hips and hind limbs. In these textbooks, it talks about whales retain pelvic and leg bones. Uh, in my book, modern whales have hind limbs, which have been reduced to only a few tiny internal high limb bones that have no function. They say from bossy to blowhole, is this how whales evolved? They've evolved because whales used to walk on their hind legs so that went from a, a cow to a, a whale in evolution. Another example of a pelvis, and they thought it's leg bones. Just imagine, whales rocking around. It's true. If you go to the L.A. Museum of Natural History, that's what they're talking about. These bones here. Killer whale bones in the back, uh, also in dolphins. But those bones are needed for whales to reproduce since they have no arms or ability to speak to their mate in the dark underwater, both male and female whales have to be able to maneuver their reproductive organs with special muscles attached to those bones to have baby whales. You would think they would know this. Uh, Dr. Karl Popper, leading philosopher of science, says evolution is not a fact. Evolution doesn't even qualify as a theory or a hypothesis. It is, it is a metaphysical research program and is not really testable science. Evolution is unproved and unprovable. We believe it only because the only alternative is special creation, and that is unthinkable. Transformism, or evolution, is a fairy tale for the adults. The theory has helped nothing in the progress of science. It is useless. Uh, the director of the National Museum of Natural History said, it's results from this experiment that the theory of evolution is not exact. Evolution is a kind of dogma which its own priests no longer believe, but which they uphold for the people. It's necessary to have the courage to state this is only so that the men of future generations may orient their research in a different direction. Evolution is a light which illuminates all facts, which all lines of thought must follow. This is what evolution is. But when we compare that to the Bible, Psalm 119, 105, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Romans 128, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. 2 Thessalonians 2.11, and for this reason God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Romans 120, for since the creation of the world, his Invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So if creation is true, there's a creator. If evolution is true, there's no creator. If creation is true, there are rules. Evolution is true, there are no rules. If creation is true, there's a purpose to life. Evolution, there's no purpose to life. Creation, man is a fallen creature in need of a savior. Evolution, man is evolving without no need of a savior. Creation, man brought death into the world. Evolution, death brought man into the world. If creation is true, there is an afterlife. Evolution, there is no afterlife. Creation, there is comfort in knowing the future. Evolution, there is no hope of knowing the future. And Numbers 23:19, God is not a man that he should lie. Titus 1, 2, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. And last one, Romans 10, 13, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thanks for your attention. Appreciate it.